Hello, my name is Wolfram Borgart, and I'm from the Toyota Research Institute, or short TRI. And today I'm going to talk about uh, self-supervised learning for perception task in automated driving, an approach that we are following to, to build uh, automated uh, vehicles. A few words about the Toyota Research Institute. The Toyota Research Institute was established in January 2016 with an initial budget of $1 billion. Um, we are located at three different sites in Los Altos, Ann Arbor, and in Cambridge. And we focus on automated driving, robotics, uh, advanced material design and discovery, and machine-assisted uh, co uh, cognition. And right now, we are approximately 320 uh, people at TRI. The uh, goal of TRI is uh, to transform the human condition and doing this uh, in three ways. And the first one is uh, safety. That is the so-called guardian, where we are trying to build that what we call the non-crashable car, a uh, safety system that prevents um, the driver from making any fatal mistakes. The second one is providing access uh, to everyone. This is the so-called chauffeur application or level four, level five automation, where we wanna build an automated vehicle that uh, can um, perform a, a mobility as a service application. And thirdly, we are working on uh, quality of life and here we are developing robotic systems that can support um, elderly people in particular in their homes. The automated driving approach of TRI is the so-called uh, one system, two modes approach where we do have one vehicle that can operate in two different uh, modes. Um, the first one is the well-known chauffeur application, which is the level four, level five uh, automation. In this case, we uh, assume that we do have a fully autonomous driving system that is engaged at all times. And uh, with the goal of actually building a mass application in the long term. The second one is the so-called guardian um, application where the driver is engaged but the vehicle monitors the driver and intervenes in order to help prevent the driver from making any fatal mistakes. Right? And this builds on a similar uh, hardware uh, and also software uh, as the fully autonomous chauffeur. We often get asked how long it's going to take until we finally have a, a self-driving car. And uh, in this context, I wanna um, refer to my colleague Edwin Olson, who is uh, former member of TRI as well, uh, who um, came up with this interesting uh, argument um, a little bit more than a year ago, um, where he actually introduced that what he calls Moore's law for self-driving vehicles. So what you typically take as a measure for performance is the um, miles between disengagement uh, rate. And uh, now let's assume that we are able to have a few realize a Moore's law for this uh, for this disengagement rate, which means that we double the disengagement rate uh, every 16 months, right? um, which means that we would have a, a line like this one down here on this logarithmic scale. Right? And um, let's assume we are able to keep that uh, disengagement uh, rate increase over time. And uh, what we then are interested in is that point in time where we actually um, inter intersect with the human level performance, uh, which would mean that um, self-driving vehicles have the same performance as humans. And uh, we do this calculation, then it turns out um, that uh, it will take 16 years to reach a uh, human level of performance, which would be in 2035. Although that um, is, is a very, very long time, um, keeping that or as, uh, reaching that pace is also a very, very difficult problem. And um, the key question is, 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 is how we can actually make that happen, that we get Moore's law for self-driving and uh, double the performance every year. The standard approach for, for doing this is basically, um, or one potential approach for doing this is basically to program everything. That's not entirely possible because um, maps typically need to be learned and it uh, doesn't really make sense to program them. Um, on the other hand, 
there is the, the so-called uh, scientist who might say, okay, why don't we learn everything? Which uh, immediately raises the question of where do we get all the data from? And then one popular answer in this context is simulation, which again raises the question like, how can we actually make a simulation so performant and, and, and so versatile that we actually have the ability to learn everything? Then there is the machine learning engineer who might come up with this argument saying, yeah, if we only had enough data and we could only label everything, right? And if you label everything, then um, um, we can learn everything. And uh, yeah, why this sounds reasonable in the first place and has been a very, very popular approach over the past uh, years, uh, it has its limitations as well. So if you look at these scenes that you see uh, here, um, then uh, you can easily imagine that it is going to be extremely hard to really label everything and, and extremely expensive um, uh, to do so. TRI's approach is um, that what we call to learn from everyone. And uh, I will talk about this in on the next slide and utilize the data from um, the Toyota cars to actually uh, learn the um, how to drive, uh, which immediately imposes the, the question of how we can actually infer structure. So um, how does it how does it work? So um, Toyota is a company that, in contrast to other companies in this sector, has a so-called data advantage by because of the fact that Toyota has plenty of vehicles uh, in the world and driving outside. Um, and since many of them are equipped with plenty of sensors, you can, you can regard this as an enormously large uh, sensor fleet. And with that, we could basically cover all US roads uh, under, in under a day and that by multiple times. The key question now is, so how can we actually effectively drink from this data firehose? So how can we effectively use this data? Um, we know that learning from everything is unfeasible and that we somehow need to learn from unbiased, diverse, diverse and representative data. Um, we also, in the end, need to leverage the large volumes of unlabeled and structured data. So because it, it, it's not feasible to label everything, which immediately poses problems uh, in the context of data curation, querying, active learning and also synthesis. And um, the strategy of TRI is uh, to utilize supervised learning in combination with self-supervised learning from large volumes of structured and unlabeled data. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in, uh, in the next 20 minutes and basically tell you how we are uh, going to uh, realize um, this approach that we can actually utilize self-supervised learning in order to uh, improve the performance of our cars. I'm going to talk about uh, three different approaches. The first one is um, um, super depth, self-supervised uh, learning of depth. Um, then we'll talk about an improvement of this um, so-called self-supervised pseudo LiDAR networks. And uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about real-time and approach to real-time panoptic segmentation. Super depth, um, self-supervised super resolved monocular depth estimation is the paper that uh, uh, was published last year at ICRA 2019 when we were still able to meet in person. And um, the, um, the general motivation for this is that um, Toyota cars in the future and already right now since uh, Toyota Safety Sense 2.0 equipped with cameras uh, for various purposes um, but um, the, the key question is can we utilize these cameras for for other uh, problems as well. For example, for inferring depth and maybe develop some collision warning system just based on, on, on camera data. Um, the um, motivation for this is that lighters are too expensive to be built into, uh, into cars. And um, while every car has a camera, um, at least a single one, we can, um, hope that by being able to inferring depth from the single camera, we can offer additional services to the driver and additional uh, safety features to um, future customers of Toyota. 
So monocular depth estimation, the problem basically is uh, to take an image from, uh, from a camera and then assign to every pixel um, a depth value, basically calculate a corresponding depth image for that uh, RGB image. And um, that is typically done with uh, systems like monodepth network sets, how we call them. How would the supervised approach look like? The supervised approach would basically take the raw data from the camera uh, and use a model to make predictions and then calculate a loss based on target values or labels um, that are um, generated. In some cases, they come relatively cheap by, uh, by LIDAR, but if no LIDAR is available, then one in the worst case has to generate those by hand, which is going to be very, very expensive and also difficult to acquire. And, uh, yeah, once you have these target values, then you can calculate your loss and then improve your model based on this loss. The uh, self-supervised approach, in contrast, um, uses the raw data themselves with some sort of prior knowledge to calculate this loss and improve the model. And in this uh, super depth approach, uh, what we're doing there basically is we're using uh, a second camera. So we assume that the vehicle has a stereo system, namely a left and, uh, and a right camera. And then we are following the, going the following approach. Um, we use our monodot network to calculate the depth. And then based on the depth and the RGB image, we can perform a view synthesis, synthesis and basically ask ourselves, how would the camera image from the right-hand side camera look like? And if you compare this to the actual image from the right camera, then uh, we can calculate the proxy loss, which then uh, can be improved, but used to improve the, the monodepth network. This is basically the idea of this paper. Um, the uh, objective function there, or the loss function, is basically uh, com consists of three components, which is the um, photometric loss that comes from the view synthesis and the real image, and then a depth regularization term and an occlusion regularization term. An interesting aspect here of this work is also that uh, we made the observation that this multi-scale photometric loss is limited by resolution and uh, by super resolving the um, uh, disparities and synthesizing at higher resolutions, we can actually further uh, improve the performance. And uh, this uh, can be seen by these uh, plots over here, where for the first three, higher means better, and for the bottom two, uh, lower means better. We can actually see that with increasing uh, resolution, the, uh, the, the performance still gets better. And um, on top of that, uh, we also realized uh, a flip augmentation. We basically flip the image and um, thus can uh, get augmented data or have a data augmentation that helps us to further boost the performance. And uh, the comparison of this approach with state of the art um, techniques shows very, very promising results. So we uh, are outperforming the state of the art in, in various um, uh, measures. Here are a few qualitative results uh, for, um, for this approach. And um, you can in particular see that it very, very well handles like uh, thinner structures like these poles over here or this uh, pole of the, the traffic sign over here. Um, and also the edges are relatively correct. And um, what is also uh, interesting, so in, in, in comparison, this is a qualitative comparison to, to monodepth, um, where we find that some structures like the backside of the truck is more accurate, uh, or other aspects like thinner structures in general, uh, or finer details and boundaries are actually better with the, with the super depth approach. For me as a slam person, it's particularly interesting that we, with this, can even recover the, um, the trajectory of the vehicle and compare this to the ground truth. Red is ground truth, uh, blue is the um, trajectory recovered by this method. And uh, as you can see, even without running a slam a system, we get relatively accurate here, even with the single camera. Here are a few videos um, showing the um, system, uh, the, the, uh, the approach in action, and um, on the bottom, a top image, depth image, and then in the bottom, the reconstructed point clouds. 
um, and you can see that uh, the system actually it almost looks like a lidar scan, uh, which I find uh, pretty impressive, to be honest. So um, while this works greatly, the disadvantages of this is, lies in the fact um, that um, we need to, the second camera in order to um, to get the supervision signal. And um, the, in order to get rid of this, we uh, developed this approach uh, called self-supervised pseudo lidar networks, which is based on uh, the paper three D packing for self-supervised monocular depth estimation which was presented by our team at uh, CVPR this year and was an oral presentation. So as we know, like this is the standard approach, uh, supervised um, in the self-supervised, we want to have some sort of like using prior knowledge to eff effectively generate this loss from the data themselves. Um, and the idea of this um, self-supervised structure for motion approach is basically instead of using the left and the right camera, using only one camera, but uh, uh, going from time t or from time t minus one to time t. And basically, the approach is very, very similar. We predict the depth for the, the view at time t minus one. You can also do this inversely. And then, based on the depth, we perform a view synthesis about how the world would have looked like at time t minus one. And from this, we can, with the information from time t minus one, the actual image, we can calculate the proxy loss. And uh, the structure of the network uh, is as follows. We first have our PACnet, which is a novel, uh, which has a novel uh, network architecture to predict the depth. Then based on the image and the previous image, we use PostConfNet to perform, to calculate the rotation and the translation. And that gives us then, um, the basis for the view synthesis, where we calculate the, where we make a prediction about um, uh, that, that image, and then um, make a calculated photometric loss. The problem now is uh, here that um, we don't get the scale typically, uh, unless we get the uh, velocity from a velocity supervision uh, of from a velocity signal like uh, the car itself or an IMU. And with that, we can actually incorporate an additional velocity supervision loss, which then also helps us to get the correct uh, scale in the, um, in the approach. Um, here is uh, a few results on, um, on the data set that we published with uh, together with this paper, the DDAD data set. And, um, on the left-hand side again, you see the images, um, bottom the depth image, and on the right-hand side, um, a synthesized uh, LIDAR uh, scan based on the depth information and the RGB information. The um, interesting aspect here is uh, of this paper is that we do have um, specific architecture and novel architecture, so-called uh, PACnet architecture, which uh, performs packing in, instead of pooling uh, on top of the convolutions. And in uh, addition, it performs unpacking uh, in, in, instead of the, the, the uh, unconvolutions. And the um, idea there is, on the advantage of this is that it actually is able to capture more details of uh, um, then with the convolution and pooling uh, approach that you uh, typically find in other approaches. The experimental results are pretty impressive uh, in this case. Um, so you can see that we outperform the state of the art. Um, like the monodepth uh, two methods. Uh, and what is uh, particularly interesting um, is that um, the self-supervised approach is even slightly by a tiny little uh, margin um, better than uh, supervised approaches. And that is very, very promising that we actually now can get uh, with the self-supervised approaches to a level that we typically see from, from supervised methods. 
And here are a few uh, experimental or quanti quantitative results, again, in comparison with, uh, with other approaches. Again, fine structures are uh, like visible at and here, like super thin poles um, and um, other um, features as well. And a further interesting aspect is uh, the comparison to, to, to ResNet and the learning uh, capacity. And what we can see here is that the that we appear to have make better usage of the, the network capacity. We are still like uh, learning, whereas the ResNet architectures seem to uh, start to level uh, over here already. Right? And um, we furthermore can do uh, perform a better generalization. So when we learn on Kitty and train on new scenes, then uh, we also outperform the ResNet architectures um, substantially. Here are a few examples that uh, I find uh, pretty impressive. Um, for example, the poles again over here, or this fence, um, which super thin structures that is well captured in the, in the depth information. Something that is particularly interesting for me as a person from automated driving is um, that uh, we accurately get these cones over here. And cones, um, for those who have like, worked with LIDARs and uh, try to detect and identify LIDARs, uh, cones and LIDAR uh, measurements, they, you might know that they are, pose certain challenges. And uh, we can see the interesting aspect is that we can clearly see them here in the depth information, which uh, shows is, is very, very promising from the perspective of uh, being able to fuse LIDAR and vision in the context of certain objects. Um, here's a, on the bottom, you see a, um, a video showing or projecting the, in the, the LIDAR scans for the individual uh, images of, uh, of a surround view system into, um, into this 3D space and generating basically a full 360 LiDAR from uh, the individual images uh, from the camera setup that we have. And uh, yeah, if you want to have a look at the data sets, it's dense depth for autom auto autonomous driving uh, published uh, over here. So after having spoken about um, inferring depth from, from vision, uh, then we are, I'm going to speak a little bit also about uh, the task of real-time panoptic segmentation, uh, which is um, a particular relevant uh, task as well. This paper goes back to this real-time panoptic segmentation from dense detections by this team over here, and it was also an oral presentation at CBPR this year. Um, so the goal of um, panoptic segmentation is, in addition to perform a semantic segmentation, also to provide instance level um, classification, uh, instance level segmentations, meaning it, identifying the individual cars on, and potentially also pedestrians in such uh, image sequences. So objects of relevance for self-driving cars, for example. And uh, the problem with the uh, with these approaches is why they are um, pretty performant, uh, they are, suffer from relatively high computation uh, requirements. And uh, the goal here of, of this paper is basically to get from here to here and um, get to a performant approach that uh, is, uh, is all, all, also runs at a decent frame rate. So how does this, uh, th does this approach work? So we are basically taking the input image and perform a semantic segmentation. Then we do perform dense bounding box uh, calculation. Uh, and from these bounding boxes, by using the non-maximum suppression, we generate so-called query bounding boxes, which we then in turn uh, utilize in order uh, to perform dense bounding box querying. And from this, we calculate uh, the so-called uh, uh, mask assignment. And if we combine the semantic segmentation with these uh, with these masks, then uh, and we in the end get that what we call the panoptic segmentation over here. And uh, this is the the key idea. Um, the overall the architecture is a little bit more complicated as with many uh, panoptic segmentation um, approaches. 
we use a stack of these uh, recent uh, 50 networks and on top of that uh, them a panoptic head um, that generates dense bounding boxes um, with um, different features over here and from that the global navness, elevenness and the global semantic segmentation. The variation on um, cityscapes and cocoa shows really promising results. So in both phase is our approach here and underlined over here are the, um, the most performant uh, two-stage approaches and what we can see is that we are outperforming some even of the uh, two-stage approaches um, that we are um, outperforming the single stage approaches, but we are at the same time um, substantially faster than all of the other approaches. So, which means that we only have a slight decrease in performance over here, while at the same time having a substantial performance boost. And um, same on the COCO data set, right, we um, have a slight decrease in, uh, the, in the PQ value, uh, but uh, with substantial increase in the computation time. On the right hand side, you see some uh, qualitative um, results again, um, and I leave you a few seconds with the question, which one is from uh, our approach and which, which one is from the UPS net over here, and the solution is here. Finally, I, I want to report on a, on a study that we did um, about the usefulness of the, the supervision signal. Uh, so as you can imagine, the instance level masks are uh, pretty expensive to acquire. Uh, so we made an analysis as to whether it's possible to replace them just by instance level bounding boxes, and uh, the, which we call a weekly supervised uh, um, approach. And, and here we can actually see that by doing so, we can actually reduce the, um, we, we get a lower performance in the PQ value, but uh, at a like um, at a very, very little, a low um, reduction rate, which is only 5%. Right? Even if we go from a really weak supervision signal go to a weak supervision signal, we only get a very, very like, a slight loss in, in performance. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, what I wanted to show is um, that building truly autonomous car requires machine learning from uh, my perspective. Uh, and also that is uh, basically the TRI approach. The supervised learning approach does not uh, scale to our opinion. And uh, we need to go beyond supervised learning and be able to learn from structured and unlabeled data. And uh, what I wanted to do today is show you in, in a few aspects how TRI uh, is uh, approaching this problem and uh, working on a solution to this. Thank you very much. <laughs>